Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, the invitation. I'm glad to be there. I'm going to present you this paper on hosting media bias, uh, which is joint work with uh, Maurice Engel, uh, who was a PhD student at Sciences Po and who actually uh, just uh, joined uh, the European uh, Union to uh, work on the DSA data. Uh, uh, Nicolas Hervé, who is a computer scientist uh, at the Institut National de l'Audiovisuel, and uh, Camille, uh, that you all uh, know here in the, here in the, in the room. Okay. okay, it works. Uh, I think if you if you look at the the state of the media industry a little bit everywhere in the world, or at least in Western democracies, uh, you see that the state of, of the industry is pretty bad. Uh, we see that uh, with the increasing concentration uh, of the of the industry. You can look at the case of the U.S. when you see a small number of conglomerates buying more and more local newspapers, which is also true uh, for the local TV market. Uh, this is uh, also the case uh, in France. Uh, when they, there were a recent inquiry uh, into Vivendi's takeover of a number of different media outlets, uh, including like newspaper, radio, TV. In fact, the European Commission just uh, gave the green light uh, a week ago. Uh, and there was this uh, issue of the lack of pluralism, which is not specific to the US or to France that we also find, for example, in the, in the UK, for example, there were uh, a number of issues uh, against uh, Murdoch uh, and decisions taken by uh, both uh, Ofcom and the regulation authority uh, in the in the UK. Uh, this issue of like media concentration, like pluralism of the media, who owns the media in a sense, uh, is not new. It's a pretty like old issue in the econ literature. Uh, I can see like the, the first paper, I guess, would be like Junkov, uh, who owns the media in 2003 with a number of co-authors. Of course, there is a famous Fox newspaper uh, by De La Vigna and Kaplan on the, on the consequences of uh, uh, change in uh, ownership. Uh, but the thing is that uh, we have like this growing concerns about the extent of media consolidation, in particular, because if I compared in a number of countries the state of the media industry 20 years ago and today, uh, it is worse today <laughs> than what it was uh, 20 uh, years ago. Uh, it might seem strange to you, because a lot of people are going to argue this is a strange overview of the media industry. Look at the number of media outlets around. Okay, go on the internet, uh, open a website. You will find like uh, 100 different news websites, uh, and you will find also a lot of like uh, TV channels, and you can find some like TV channels on YouTube. So there are like much more media uh, today than they were in the past. So we should see less concentration. Uh, I want to highlight two things here. First, this is not true in the majority of the case in terms of market share. Second, even if it was true in terms of, of market share, market share is not enough at all to consider here. And what we really need to look at is what uh, Andrea Pratt uh, first used to call uh, attention shares in his media power paper. And this attention shares, by the way, what was, was used in the UK recently uh, in the case uh, against uh, Murdoch. So the issue is not so much to know uh, how many media do you have or what are the market shares of the different media outlets. You want also to you to look at the way people consume news. And it turns out that in today's world, despite the huge supply of different media outlets, uh, a lot of people they still just consume one or, or two media. And for example, in Andrea's work, we see very well that a lot of people, for example, just watch Fox News. So you don't really care that Fox News is competing with CNN uh, in terms of exposition to pluralism. You want to understand the kind of uh, content that is produced of Fox News to know whether or not people get different point of view on uh, what is happening in the uh, in the world. Okay, and this is why when we talk about pluralism, in general there are two kinds of regulations that can be implemented. One kind of regulation is what we can call external pluralism. So this is really where you want to limit. Uh, market concentration. So basically, you will have some rules. We have rules for market concentration for all uh, uh, the different sectors. In general, in a number of countries, you have extra rules for the media, where you will say that, for example, like a given owner cannot own more than 30% of the total market share, or that you can own a TV and a newspaper, but then you cannot own a radio, this kind of like cross ownership rules. But these rules might not be sufficient. And this is where a number of countries thought it was of importance to also consider internal pluralism, which is to ensure a diversity of point of view 
within a given media outlet, in particular for TV and also for radio, because we know that a number of people will just watch one TV channel and not many TV channels. This has first been the case, in fact, in the US. Like the US, it tends to innovate on a number of topics, uh, but very often they introduce early regulation and then they change their, their mind also early. Uh, in the US, this was the fairness doctrine introduced in the 1950s uh, by the FCC, the Federal Communication Commission. Uh, it was repealed at the end of the 1980s uh, following uh, Reagan, uh, Reagan uh, uh, policies and the fact that he changed the head of the FCC when he uh, made it to power. Uh, but you still have the equivalence of the fairness doctrine in the UK, for example, uh, with uh, the Ofcom or in France uh, with, uh, with the Arcom. And in a sense, this will be kind of the focus of this paper when we are going to look at pluralism of viewpoints uh, broadcast in each uh, media outlet. I'm also quickly uh, going to discuss, because this is linked to our findings, uh, other tools that you can use to ensure pluralism, and in particular, the fact of uh, reinforcing protections for editorial independence in the newsroom. And I get that this is at the middle of the discussion of the European Media uh, Freedom, uh, Freedom Act. OK? One of the issues why it might, one might have, have when we talk about media concentration, people might say, OK, you are afraid about media concentration because you think that if there is a lot of concentration, one single owner is going to determine the editorial line of a media outlet. And so this will have important consequences. But then people might tell you, yeah, OK, you have one owner. But then you have 100 people, or 200, or 500, or 800 different journalists working for a media outlet. And these different journalists might have a variety of viewpoints, and they might use these viewpoints, in a sense, to drive the editorial guidelines, depending on their uh, preferences. OK? And in a sense, the variety of journalists can compensate the fact that we only have a few owners. And this is what we are going to measure in this, in, in this paper. OK? What we are going to measure in this paper, in a sense, is the extent to which journalists have some agency and the extent to which journalists can bias the news depending on their own preferences, independently of the editorial line of the media outlets. For that, we are going to focus on TV and radio. And we are going to focus on TV and radio because the way we are going to measure bias in this paper is by looking at uh, the guests who are invited to speak in the different uh, shows. OK? So basically, we are going to tackle the extent to which journalists have some agency when decided who speaks in their show. For that, what we did with Kami Moritz and uh, uh, Nicola is that we built a completely new data set that basically includes the universe of shows broadcast on the main French TV and radio uh, channels between 2002 and 2020. So we have 20 outlets. So basically, the idea is to have all the generalist TV channels and radio stations. I will come back to the data a little bit later on. Uh, over during this time period, uh, we have data on all the appearances of guests on this show. So we have 2.3 million guests. Uh, we have 39 distinct hosts, and we have uh, 260 distinct guests at the end of the of the day. When I say I'm going to look at uh, the decision of who I want uh, to invite on my show, I'm going to focus here on like political bias. So what we need to do once we have the identity of the guest is to classify them, and in particular to classify them politically. We will do it in two ways, and this is pretty important for us. The first thing that we will do is to classify politicians, and then we will also classify those that we call in the paper as uh, the pinups uh, for politically engaged non-politicians. So this can be like activists, this will be pundits. So people who are not politicians, who are not candidates, who never run for campaign, but who are politically engaged. And you will see that this matters a lot, in particular in countries like France, but also the UK, when you have some regulation on the speaking time of politicians and where channels may decide to use the pinups as a way to escape regulation. Because in none of these countries, and in none of the countries I know of, in fact, uh, you have speaking time regulation 
for the pinup. Okay. And so by using this classification of gaze between like non-politician, politician spin-ups, we can compute the timeshare of each uh, political family for each of the of the show. Okay. And then we are going to look at variation across channels in the political leaning of guests. And in particular, we are going to see whether or not channels have different hosts, whether they impose different guidelines, and whether also hosts they tend to sort on different channels depending on their political uh, political preferences. Okay, how can we identify that? Okay, the role played by host versus the role played by uh, channels and other factors. We can do it because we have a lot of movers. So we have a lot of journalists in our data set who either like within a given year or like from one year to the other are going to move from one channel to the other. So we can use this move to see whether they are going to change the kind of host they invite upon move, depending on the channel they join. Okay, and this is going to allow us, like technically this would be identified with a two-way uh, fixed, effect, uh, fixed effect model. This is going to allow us to explain the share of the variance between channels that come to the channel from the channel fixed effect and the channel fixed effect can reflect either the owner's preferences or the test of, of the audience, that I will come back to it, or whether this is due to the journalist's preferences or whether this is due to sorting. So sorting is, okay, right-wing journalists decide to join right-wing channel, left-wing journalists decide to join left-wing channel, and so there is a coincidence uh, between the preferences of, uh, of the two, okay? So this is what we do in the first part of, of the paper and what I would present to you in the first part of the talk. Okay. And then the second thing that we do, that we will use an uh, event study design. So we, we will use an important change in media ownership in recent years in France, and in particular, the fact that Vincent Bolloré. So Vincent Bolloré, he, he gave rise to a lot of media coverage uh, by international newspapers. And basically, all the newspapers in the UK or in the US, they call him the French Murdoch. So let's call him the French Murdoch because this is a good way to define the guy. Uh, he, he, he took over three TV channels in 2015. Uh, he has a pretty uh, strong uh, radical uh, 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 right uh, wing uh, stance. And we will see the extent to which, first thing, we will quantify the extent to which the takeover by using the difference in difference design shift the set of guests invited to the right. So that we will quantify it. But then we will go one step further. And I think this is really where our paper contributes with the two parts. Is that we will understand the mechanisms through which media bias work. And in particular, we will kind of open the black box of media bias by looking at the host who stayed, looking at the host who left following uh, the, the, the takeover, looking at their destination channel, and see, in fact, the extent to which the remain, remain, remaining host uh, 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 comply or not with the uh, new editorial line. And I think this is an important contribution. If I'm just telling you, okay, you have a new owner, okay, you have like Bolloré, it's like uh, you have Murdoch and Fox News, you have a shift to the right, that's nice, we can quantify it, that might be of interest for, for French regulator, but that's not really new. What is really new here is really to go one step further and to understand the way bias work. Okay, and a lot of people don't know how bias work. You can wonder like whether this is about the owner showing it in, up into the newsroom every morning saying, okay, let's look at what you are going to broadcast tonight. Or whether this is about him picking the right guys at the right place, which is something that we are going to document. And you will see that also, and this is kind of key, the agency of the journalist, so the characteristics of the journalist who stayed, who left, uh, who comply more or less, it depends on, on a number of characteristics. Uh, it will depend on uh, their gender to begin with. It will also depend on their experiment. It will de depend on their ratings. So you will see that in a sense, the agency of the journalists or the way they can fight against the change in editorial line, like all the journalists are not equal. And you, you can like, have policy implications uh, from this kind of, uh, of findings. Just to give you a brief overview of the results, uh, the first result that we have uh, is that basically uh, uh, there is a lot of compliance. 
So the channel fixed effect overall they explain uh, around 90% of the observed variance between channels, which is huge. And not only is it huge, but it has increased over time. An increase we are going to relate to the fact that the market is becoming more and more concentrated with less and less journalists' job. So at the end of the day, journalists, when they have a job, they follow the editorial line. Uh, composition, so the, 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 the role played by journalist preferences is very low, like around 3%. And we do have a little bit of, uh, of sorting. In terms of how us react to ownership change, we will see that uh, there is a lot of compliance. Uh, something that you see that the, following the takeover, you have an increase by nearly 50% in the speaking time of the radical right. And if you look at the journalist who stayed, the magnitude of the increase is nearly as high as overall. So it really means that the journalists who stayed, they just comply with the new uh, editorial uh, line. And we will also uh, document uh, some uh, sorting with the leaving of a number of uh, hosts. So compared to the existing literature, I guess we uh, contribute mostly to two kinds of different literature. The first one is the literature on media bias. So there is a lot of literature that try to measure uh, media bias. You can do that by looking at, looking at endorsement. The literature working on historical newspapers have done that a lot, in particular in the US. More and more, thanks to the progress of uh, natural language uh, uh, processing, uh, you can look at the language used uh, by the newspapers. And the more we will have transcript, uh, the more we will also look at the language used uh, by the uh, TV and radio stations. You can look at agenda setting. Uh, you have also new work that is pretty nice uh, on visual bias. Uh, in this paper, what we look at is a choice of guest. So in a sense, what we do, the closest work in the literature is the one by um, Ruben Durante and Brian Knight on Berlusconi TV uh, with two main contributions that are important. Uh, the first contribution is really the idea of not focusing only on politicians, and this really matters. We need to consider all the invited guests. And the second one that is even more important in, in a sense that in general, when people tackle this issue in political economy, they just consider newscast. But we would show you that we should not focus only on newscast. We should focus on all the kind of shows, in particular because on a lot of TV channels, in, including 24 hours news channel, we have less and less newscast, more and more talk shows, because it's less expensive very often to produce a, a talk show than uh, to produce some news on the field. Uh, and this is also an easy way for you to do some politics, because you take two guys, they fight together, they're not politicians, they're pinups, so they're not regulated, and you can push an agenda uh, this way, OK? Uh, the second literature we contribute to is the literature on the determinants of media bias. So at least since 2010, Gensko Shapiro paper, there was a huge fight whether this is about demand or about supply. You can have theoretical models uh, that are going to back up uh, both kind of assumptions. I would say that uh, Gensko Shapiro claim mainly in favor of the demand side, and demand may matter a little bit, but we have more and more evidence uh, on Fox historically, now on Sinclair, uh, that at the end of the day, uh, what matters is also uh, owners, so choice driven by uh, the supply side. This paper uh, we consider like a third driver of bias, uh, which are uh, journalists themselves, uh, and we measure whether or not journalists have agency within their organization. In fact, there are two old theoretical papers that were making this assumption, never brought it to the data. Uh, so we are like the first one to do that. And we think that this is important because it also allows us to better understand the mechanisms through which uh, owners may bias the, the news. OK. So I don't know whether you have questions about that or. OK, so this is the, the, the roadmap for, for what I'm going to do. First, going to present you the data. Then we will do the first part, let's say, when we show the relative importance of channel fixed effect, journalist fixed effect, and sorting. And then we will turn uh, to uh, the Bolloré takeover as a case study of what happened when we have a change uh, in, uh, in ownership. So in terms of data, we have this new data set uh, that covers uh, 20 uh, TV channels and radio stations from 2002 to 2020. So basically, the idea was to take all the main generalist TV channels and radio stations. For example, what we won't have is a music-only radio station that won't be included. Uh, for all of these channels, 
uh, we have their uh, content. So in terms of coverage, uh, we have nearly everything uh, with at least uh, one guest and one host. So we will have news, talk shows, infotainment, documentaries with guests, etc. What is not included here uh, is fiction, games, and sport. Okay. If we have, if we have no guest or no host. Basically, this won't be introduced in the data. If you have at least one guest or one host, this will be part of the, of the of the data. So this is the overall sample we use in particular for descriptive statistics. For identification, we will mainly focus on 2005-2019. We do that for two reasons. First of all, a lot of channels enter into the French market that were completely changed uh, in 2005. So basically, in 2005, you have a huge change in the competitiveness uh, of the market with the entry of many different TV channels, uh, which make it like strange to compare uh, the pre-2005 to the post-2005 period are as if they were like equivalent market. Uh, the reason to stop in 2019 uh, is not such a good reason. It's rather a bad reason. Uh, it's the fact that the data we use here is data that is collected mainly from the Institut National de l'Audiovisuel. So the national... Uh, Audiovisual Institute, which is the repository of the French uh, TV and radio, and where Nicolas Hervé is a computer science. And basically, the way the data is built uh, is that it's entirely documented manually by archivists who watch all, all the shows and who document the number of guests, the number of hosts, the topic of the show, this kind of stuff. Uh, and in 2019, uh, they, decide, they decided to save some money and they fired uh, some activists, uh, some archivists, <laughs> some activists too, perhaps, I don't know. Uh, and so they reduced the staff and the number of uh, channels uh, became uh, no longer to be documented. So at least we have this full, complete, exhaustive sample uh, for 14 years uh, covering 2005-2019, okay? For this data, we have uh, the following information. We have information about the host, which is pretty detailed. So this is not only about like the, the main host, this is also about like all uh, the uh, segments of the shows. So like think about like the morning uh, newscast that can last for one hour and a half. You know, you have the, the main encore and then you have journalists interviewing people. We will have all this information minute by minute. So we have the amount of time in fact spent by each of the hosts. At the end of the day, we have 39 distinct hosts. Uh, we will use 13,000 of them uh, in the estimation sample, given that the estimation sample, we will only keep hosts who interviewed at least twice a politically classified guest. Okay, 46% uh, of them appear on distinct outlets, uh, and 68% uh, percent of them appear on the same network in two different uh, uh, years' time uh, season. This is important for us because we need to have enough movers. So 46,000 are going to move from one channel to, to the other over our 20 years time period. But we also need them to appear more than once because if they are just here for like one or two years, then their effect will be completely like uh, absorbed uh, by, the, by the time fixed effect. Uh, in terms of guests, so we have information on all the guests. By the way, whether or not they are in the studio or like doing uh, some doing uh, some press conferences or this kind of stuff, uh, we have two hundred sixty thousand uh, distinct guests for more than two point three million appearances of guests. Uh, obviously, like all the guests do not have the same uh, probability to appear, and we will have some like top guests. Uh, one of the uh, most visible, well, if I take the five most visible uh, guests uh, in the in all the shows in our data, they are either. Uh, uh, president uh, or like a prime minister. Uh, so 25% of the guests in terms of professions are politicians. We have like 25% uh, also for the media, public industry, 13% from the entertainment sector. We have academic and experts, sport, etc., etc. Okay. So then what do we do from that? We want to classify the guests and to determine uh, their political leaning, if any. And I, I might repeat it, but our measures of political leaning of each of the guests obviously do vary over time. This is true for politicians that can move from one party to the other. I don't know whether like this often happens in German politics, except when parties split, <laughs> which happens apparently. Uh, but this happens often like in French politics, okay? You can move from one party to the other. And the other thing is that uh, it's not because you are like a, 
uh, an economics professor and you decide to be involved in, the, in politics in 2015, that you will still be involved in politics in 2022 if you stop doing politics in between. Okay, so we are really going like to check uh, at, at a, a very fine grain level your probability to be involved in politics and for which kind of uh, political parties. I'm going to enter into the details. Before that, just look at kind of something looking like the French political landscape. So it's a little bit of a mess and it's already outdated. Uh, compared to the time when we first did this uh, plot, uh, because parties they keep changing names, uh, we really decided to tie our hand in the way we classify the parties from the left to the right. So we rely on the Chapel Hill uh, expert survey, and we classify the different political group uh, from the radical left to the radical right. Okay. How do we proceed? Uh, the simple part of what we did uh, was to classify uh, the politicians. So for that, we first use a candidate list at elections. So we took like since 2000, uh, 2000 yes, uh, all the candidates at national elections, so presidential election, legislative elections. Then we look at European elections, Senate elections, regional elections, municipal elections, etc. Then we look at all the members of parliamentary groups. And we also look at government members. Uh, this is not so easy in a sense. So this is pretty easy, basically, uh, if you are called Camille Urvois, because we do not have like uh, 16 million uh, Camille Urvois uh, in French politics. Okay. If you are called Christian Martin, it's a little bit uh, more complicated, or Jean Martin, uh, because we tend to have a lot of Jean Martin in France. Okay. And it's not because you have one Jean Martin who run for a municipal election from the Socialist Party that you want all the Jean Martin showing up of, on TV uh, to be classified as left wing. So the second thing that we did uh, is that we did, uh, after the fuzzy name ma matching, a lot of uh, manual check. And in particular, we checked manually all the guests in our sample uh, would change uh, from one party to the other to check whether this was like real change or whether this was due to the fact that uh, these are like two different uh, Jean Martin. Okay. At the end of the day, we classify uh, 8,900 uh, politicians, uh, accounting for more than 600,000 uh, appearances. Regarding the pinups, we proceeded in three ways. So it's not always easy for people who are not politicians uh, to determine uh, their political bias and whether or not they are politically engaged. So we decided to use uh, three different things. The first thing that we use is, are the party summer meeting participants. So you have these big uh, summer meetings every year for all the main political parties in France. Uh, so we look since 2000 at all the guests invited during these meetings. And basically, if you participate in one of these meetings, at a given point of time, you will be associated uh, to the political parties organizing the meeting. The second thing that we look at is that we first established a, a list of all the French think tanks. Then, in particular, by using their uh, funding, we um, uh, decided uh, the political leaning of the think tanks. And then we look at the contributors of the different think tanks. And then if you contribute to a left-wing think tank, you will be like classified on the left, to a right-wing think tank, classified on the right. And the last thing that we look at is uh, 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 the, the list of uh, signatories of OPEDs endorsing candidates in the first round of the presidential elections. Okay, So if you appear in one of these three categories, you will be linked uh, to the related political parties. But again, these are punctual events. So we are going to combine together all these punctual events in a probabilistic model. So we decided to have kind of a, like a, a sharp decay before. So like, just imagine you appear uh, in a like summer university of a party. Okay, your probability to be from this party won't be zero the day before. But like the, the, the shape of the distribution will uh, decline very, very quick. So for a couple of months, you will have like a lower, lower, lower probability to be attached to this party. And then you will have a long tail after that. So for a couple of months with a decreasing probability, you will be attached to this party. Obviously, if I see you like to the same summer universities every year, uh, you intervene in all the party uh, uh, summer meetings, plus uh, you contribute to the think tanks every month, then your probability will be one all the time. Okay. But if not, it's go really going to be uh, time varying. And this is how we are going to classify uh, the different uh, uh, pinups. 
in our uh, in our data set. Okay. So I don't know whether this is clear or not. Okay. One example just that I, I like to give because it really sees the relevance not only of the approach from a technical point of view, but also of changing the regulation. Uh, in the last presidential elections, the candidate who ranked fourth at the end of the day, Eric Zemmour, uh, is from like a new radical right party. The guy went up to 18% uh, of the pool. He did pretty well. Uh, he was a pundit before. The last presidential election in France, they took place in May uh, 2022. Until September 2021, the guy was on TV on one of the Bolloré channel. I'm going to come back to that. But he was on TV uh, one hour a day. And by ARCOM, the French regulator, it was not classified politically. If we look at our data, even the guy participated twice in the summer universities of the radical right party. It was classified already at radical right. So we did the change before ARCOM in a sense that only decided in October 2021 to consider the guy as a politician because he said at the time that he will run uh, for the presidential uh, elections. So you see the relevance, you know, of not only like focusing on uh, official candidates when you want to understand political bias uh, on uh, media outlets. At the end of the day, or perhaps let me show that to you in a graphical way. You know, in the INA data, we know the profession of the guest. Uh, so we know whether they're politicians or not politicians. We classify politically uh, 92% of the politicians as politicians, okay? Those we do not is really linked to the fact that the information on politician is time invariant, but the information on, on the profession is time invariant uh, in the uh, uh, INA data. So if you take uh, today's uh, Minister of Justice in France, okay, now he's classified as politician as a, prof as a profession, but before that, he was just a lawyer, okay? So when we see him on TV as a lawyer in our data, uh, we do not classify him poli uh, politically, but now we do, okay? And the second thing that among those who are not politicians, we classify around 5% uh, uh, of the guests uh, from a political point of view, and 3% uh, of them uh, as, uh, as pinups, okay? One of the things that I also want to highlight over time is that if you look at the speaking time share of pinups uh, over the total speaking time share uh, uh, in, the, in the data, it more than doubled during our time period. So basically it was below 10%. Uh, now it's around 20%. So if you do not look at pinups, you really miss part of the story. This is really linked to the fact that according to us, pinups are used by the channel as a way uh, to escape, uh, as a way to escape regulation. Okay. Last point that I want to highlight, it's a little bit technical, but I think it's of importance. So the, the so we measure the political leaning of the channel with the speaking time given to each of the guests. And we, we can do that uh, because we have the length of each of the show. We also have the number of guests, but I am going to assume uh, that we are treated equally. So just uh, imagine Camille, you have with Martin in the show. And perhaps Camille, you speak 90% of the time and Martin only 10%. If I look at the data, I would say, okay, you had 13 minutes and he had 13 minutes. Okay, so is it a good proxy or not? To know whether this is the case, uh, we use like recent data. So for one year of data, uh, we have information, not only on the speaking timeshare, uh, but we also use uh, information uh, based on face recognition. So how long I see your face on TV, okay? And so when you look at the correlation between the, uh, our guest timeshare and the share of your face on TV, you know, we have like a very strong positive relationship with a, a slope of 0.7. So this is not a perfect uh, test in the sense that I can see your face while Camille is speaking and probably like, oh, she's speaking too much. Uh, but still, you know, it means that what we have is kind of a good proxy of what is actually uh, happening uh, during the show. If I, if I am on the Cavit side, one of the other caveats uh, we have is that uh, I don't know how the host is uh, treating you and whether he's nice with you or not nice with you with a lot of uh, interruptions, this kind of stuff. But on average, we think that the importance you give to some political parties on the show is a good proxy uh, of uh, the, the, the importance 
of, of the bias you have in favor of this uh, political party. Okay. So if I first begin with some uh, descriptive statistics, so this is the overall, overall time share of political groups uh, in France. What you see here basically that you have a lot of variation links to the political cycle. So the right was in power between 2002 in 2012, and so you have the blue line when there are around 45% of the political timeshare. Then the left uh, won in 2012, and until 2017, uh, they had like a most political timeshare. And then, you know, the liberals is Macron won in 2017, and then, then their timeshare increased. This is partly due to regulation. So regulation in France, I can answer more questions if you want, but in a nutshell, uh, it's work that follow. For the political timeshare, you need to devote one third of the total political timeshare to members of the government. So this is the official government timeshare. And the remaining two thirds to all political parties, including political parties in power, depending on their importance. But the thing is that importance is not well defined. They say, okay, importance depends on the pools, past uh, political uh, uh, results, uh, contribution to public debate. And so there is a lot of uh, agency led to the channel uh, to choose. Uh, the, the one sort of the time given to government, it matters. You see that if you move from that to this one, when we exclude the government members, then you see that you know we lose a lot of the political uh, uh, variation, and in particular that there is not a lot of difference uh, between the uh, political time given to the left and to the uh, to the radical uh, to the radical right. We have this strong regulation, but it is strong and not so strong at the same time that you can see if you look like descriptively at the different uh, channels. So here we just rank the channels uh, according to the overall time, speaking time share devoted to uh, left-wing parties, okay? If you take a TV channel like uh, LCI, for example, on average from 2000 to 2002 to 2020, they devoted 40% of the speaking time share uh, to the left. If you take France Culture, uh, we are around 65%. So the difference is 25% at each point. Okay, it's the same for each party. So you know that Despite the existence of a regulation, you still have a lot of variations from one channel to the other. And this is what we try to explain in the rest of the paper. Uh, what explain uh, these differences? Is it something due to composition effect? So different channels have different hosts with different tastes. Uh, is it just due to compliance? So channels have strong guidelines and journalists they follow these guidelines. Okay, or do we see some sorting uh, that should amplify uh, the previous two, uh, the previous two effect? Okay. Any questions or scare? Okay. So how do you do that? Uh, I'm going to turn to the empirics in a minute. I just want to give you the intuition of what we do before. The intuition is the following: we have a host. The host is going to move from a channel that has 40% left speaking time, on average, to a channel that has 50. And so the question is that following this move, is he going to devote more speaking time to left-wing guests? Okay, so to do so, we are going to look at the uh, 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 gap between the speaking time share of the left, between the destination channel and the origin channel, okay? If the mover invites similar guests after the move, then we'll have a zero slope, and it really means that what matters are the preferences of the journalist. If the mover fully adapts to the new channel guidelines, then the slope should be one. And it means that the journalist has basically no agency. Okay. If you look at the raw data, then we'll do it properly huh, with a lot of like uh, fixed effect, controlling for like year fixed effect, season fixed effect, but just the raw data to get a sense of what is happening. Uh, whether or not you look at the left wing party's timeshare or the right wing party's timeshare, you see that the slope is around 60%. So just descriptively, the channel level decision explained around 60% of the variation in channel level representation of political groups. So moving us adapt to the guidelines set by the channels. Yeah. 
so you mentioned that politicians change parties, um, journalists may change their views and in response leave the channel. And uh, are you able to identify that? Because I think you put this now all in kind of channel compliance, but in a way that a particular host changes the composition might be feels constrained, his views have evolved and as a response changes channel in that sense, the move from uh, changing the composition reflects then his or her changes in political views. So that uh, I would show you how we uh, how we deal with that uh, in the in the in the in the in the identification strategy, the assumption that we need on the exogeneity of the move uh, in uh, in. Now, in a sense, if you want, <laughs> so, then I, I think it would be like easier to sh show that to you with the specification that we have. So basically, for those of you who, who did some uh, labor economics, you're going to say, ah, that's nice. You're just doing an AKM. And that's true. We are doing something that can be equivalent to a time varying AKM model that is used uh, by labor economists since a number of years, in particular, to understand uh, the uh, uh, um, role play, play by firms uh, and workers uh, in uh, productivity and wage. So we are going to adapt this kind of framework to under understand the determinants of media payets. So in a nutshell, what do we have? On the left-hand side, we have the speaking timeshare of a given political group in the shows hosted by host I on outlet C at time T. Okay. Uh, and what do we have on the right-hand side? So we'll have the host component so us fixed effect, and that's true that one of the limits that we have, but I will come back to that, is that we do not have time varying us fixed effect. But what we do have, and this is very important, is that we're, the, the channel component is time varying, okay? We like two seasons channel effect, and this is important because the editorial line of the channel may, may change uh, over time, like to begin with, because you might have some ownership uh, change, okay? And we have time component, in the time component, we put a lot of stuff. Uh, we have day fixed effect. So this matters a lot, okay, for day fixed effect. Date fixed effect, to be more uh, specific, uh, because from one day to the other, okay, depending on what is happening on the news, you might invite more guests from the right, from the radical right, from the left, and you don't want to capture that in our data. And we interact it uh, with our, uh, we do interact it with our because we want to control for the audience. And this is not the same thing to invite a guest at uh, noon, uh, 8 p.m. or midnight. Okay, so we don't have the audience uh, show by show. We have that a little bit. We will play a little bit at the end with that. Uh, for TV, we don't have that for radio. But and, and then on top of that, the host and guest might influence audience. But we have the average audience on TV and on radio, uh, depending on the hour of the day. So we will uh, control for uh, we will control for that. Okay, so given that what we have, our uh, identification assumption will be that host moves are as good as random, conditional on the host fixed effect, which are time invariant, on the two season channel fixed effect, and on this date hours times platform, so radio uh, or TV uh, uh, fixed effect. Okay, uh, this will be based on the fact that we use hosts that are observed on uh, multiple different channels. Okay, but that's true that uh, if with from one season to the other, like a host move uh, because of a change of, of his own preferences, that we won't be uh, able to capture it because we assume that the political preferences of the host uh, do not vary over time. And to be totally honest in this kind of model, given that we allow channel fixed effect to vary over time, I don't think that we can allow both channel fixed effect and host fixed effect to uh, to vary over time if you want to identify everything, uh, anything, but that's a strong assumption on which we rely. Yeah. Yeah. So this is also on, on, on that. So we are, so the nice thing that we have, and this is a, a huge progress in the recent literature. So before, if you were looking at AKM literature, Basically, you, you, the, both the host fixed effect and the uh, channel fixed effect were time invariant. Here, what we do is that we allow channel fixed effect to uh, vary over time, which allows us to identify not only on movers, but only on stayers. Because then, even that we have this time varying channel fixed effect, as long as uh, uh, hosts stay for more than two uh, seasons, 
we can uh, use it uh, to identify uh, the uh, role played by the different uh, journalists in terms of uh, variants. Okay, uh, so uh, just brief summary of this table. So before I was telling you, uh, if you take all the hosts, we have 39,000 hosts in our sample. If we limit to those that have at least two political uh, guests, we are down to 13,000. This is linked, like the drug between that is that these are journalists who often appear. When we look at hosts, we look at all the hosts. So if you have, I don't know, like uh, Taylor Swift in the US, one day deciding to host the uh, Super Bowl. Okay, I guess this is only popular program I know in the US. Uh, she would appear in the data as a host, but she's not a journalist. Okay, so when we will move from the set of hosts to the set of like hosts uh, we can use for identification, we are going to lose all the Taylor uh, uh, Swift. So, right. okay, <laughs> because I guess she's the most famous singer in the world. Should be able to pronounce her name properly. Uh, and so this is where we see the, the, the decrease in the size of the of the sample. Then there are like two categories of us that we can use. Uh, those who appear in two distinct two-year seasons. So these are the stayers, but we need them to stay uh, enough to be uh, uh, used in the identification. And we use also the, the mover. So these are 6,000. So at the end of the day, we can estimate with 6,000 movers and 8,000 different uh, stayers. Okay, here you have characteristics. There is one thing I want to highlight here because this is very important. Is in terms of their political characteristics as measured by the time they devote to the radical left, to the greens, to the left, to the liberals, to the right. If you compare all the host or the estimation sample, all those that are movers or stayers, you, you don't see uh, differences that are statistically significant. Okay, so this is not as if stayers are different uh, preferences than movers, because if it were to be the case, then we will have a huge issue in terms of identification. And we don't see such a difference in the in the data here. Okay, okay. Uh, so then we perform our uh, variance decomposition exercise. So to see the part of the difference in bias between channels that is due to channel host or sorting of host uh, across uh, channel. Okay, and so we will uh, estimate then the the following uh, the following model. Let me go. Okay, now that I want to show that to you quickly through the variance decomposition. I just want to first show you the result of an uh, event study around the move. Uh, this might be linked also to your previous concern uh, here. This is not a perfect answer, but we see some something here. One of the things we wanted to see is whether uh, host tended to change their invitation patterns before the move. So you can do that either to signal to the new owner that, hey, I'm to the right, you should invite me. Or perhaps it's because you are moving to the right. So you invite more and more uh, right-wing uh, guests, and then you decide that it might be easier for you to like uh, move to a right-wing channel. Okay. Uh, so what we look at here, that we look at before the move and after the move, uh, whether um, uh, 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 host fit the destination editorial line. And basically, we see nothing, no difference before the move, and then a jump to uh, uh, toward the invitation patterns of the new uh, channels just following the, just following the move. OK, this is not a perfect test that your concern is not, uh, 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 is not a concern, but at least it's reassuring as to see that you do not have like three trends in, in the behavior of host uh, before they change uh, channel. OK, when we turn to the proper uh, variance decomposition exercise, how should you read this table? You should focus on these three lines, share of variance year, year, and year. What do we have? And that if you look, uh, you can do that for the left, the right, the radical right, you won't have a lot of difference. The share of the variance that is explained by the channel fixed effect is around 90%, a little bit more, because here we have the entire time period. Uh, the host effects are very low, okay, between like 2.7 and 4%, 4 and you have a little bit of uh, sorting. Okay, so the majority of the, of, the, of the effect is really driven by channel. Yeah, I'm not yet showing you that this is driven by uh, owner's preferences because the editorial line can just like uh, 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 reflect the taste of the audience. But what you will see with the example of Bolloré takeover is that even when you have like a change in editorial line, 
not linked to change in demand, you see this importance of uh, the uh, uh, channel fixed effect, which in this case like reflect uh, the owner uh, preferences. Okay. Uh, just one more thing I want to uh, alight. Uh, the first one is, you know, you, you can ask uh, whether all the uh, journalists have the same agency or whether some journalists have a higher probability to deviate uh, with respect uh, to the channel uh, editorial uh, line. What you see here uh, is that the demographics, the fact that uh, looking at female, they tend to invite overall more left-wing guests to what will be predicted by the channel they, they work on. Okay, this is something we also find in their voting behavior on uh, on average. Uh, one more thing I want to highlight, or perhaps we saw, see that even better. Here, this is a relative deviation with respect uh, to the time slot. Here, this is the absolute deviation uh, with respect from the channel line. One of the things that is of interest here, like two things. Okay, you have a lot of stuff, but I want to like two things. Uh, this one and this one. The first one, you did not ask me, but from time to time when I present that, people say, okay, that's nice, but at the end of the day, do the journalist pick their host? Isn't it something that is more about the producer? It turns out that if you look at the main journalist in France, the most famous one, they are both journalists and producers of their own shows. Okay, they have the two jobs at the same time. And one of the things that you see here, and we will have this finding again when looking at Bolloré, is that the producers, they are the ones that have the highest probability to deviate with respect to the channel line compared to the other journalists. Okay, because in the sense, they are like more important, they have more weight, and they should have more bargaining power. We also find the same thing if we look at as a Lebio wiki entry, what does it mean uh, for each of the journalists? We look at whether they have a page on Wikipedia, and Libio is the French equivalent of the Who is Who. Basically, if they, have, if they are famous, they have a higher probability to have a Libio or Wikipedia entry. And we also see that uh, if you are like more famous, as measured by that, uh, you have a higher probability uh, to deviate from your uh, channel line. And I'm going to come back to that looking at Bolloré, because it really means that when you have a change, for example, a, a takeover of a given channel, you don't have, like, all the journalists are, 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 are not subject uh, the same way to the change in editorial line. So it means that some factors can protect better, let's say, uh, the independence of the journalists. And you might want to generalize these factors like, by law rather than just like uh, letting the, like, uh, the journalist characteristics uh, determine, determining whether they can work uh, in overall in terms of independence. The second thing that I want to alight, and this is kind of striking, and this is also linked to the fact that you have a higher share of the uh, variant that is explained today by the channels, that we see really a polarization of the channel effects. I guess this is really not specific to France. Like people like, okay, we still have to do that for the US, but my guess would be that we will have the same thing in the in the US. Just look here, you know, in the with the square, we have the channel fixed effect in 2005-7 with the uh, diamond, the channel fixed effect in 2017-19. If you look at the square, uh, the minimum you, we had uh, in 2007 was uh, uh, RMC at minus one, and the maximum uh, it was uh, here RT at uh, 0.07. Now look at the size of the channel fixed effect. We have now from minus 15 to plus 15. So we have like much more polarization of channel uh, of channel effects. And this might also have uh, consequences uh, uh, over time, okay? So for the uh, last 15 minutes, I, I want to show you uh, evidence on the Bolloré takeover. Uh, so just in a, in a nutshell, this, like Bolloré, I can talk uh, about Bolloré for five hours in a row. Huh? So if you have any question about Vincent Bolloré, <laughs> you should ask me. Uh, so Bolloré is really seen as the French Murdoch. Uh, now, now in France, he's uh, both a leader in terms of uh, media, that we will focus on that. He's also the, the leader of the publishing industry as of today, to give you an idea of the importance of the guy in the, in the, in the public debate. Uh, in 2015, uh, he took over like uh, the Canal Plus group with four di uh, three different TV channels, Canal Plus, 
uh, D8, Itele. They changed their name. So basically, it decided to rename everything with a C. So D8 became C8, Itele became C News, as like in Canal. Okay, it's why we have these like two names. Uh, more seriously, like people realize huh, that they were like a change in the editorial line. So part of what we do is to quantify something that we know we knew from a from a qualita qualitative point of view. Uh, uh, they were the one of the longest at the time. They were the longer strike uh, in uh, private media history in 2016, uh, following the ITD takeover. I say at the time because the longer one took place this summer uh, when Bolloré uh, took control of a newspaper called JDD. So the strike was ever longer this time than in 2016, uh, but uh, it was uh, as inefficient <laughs> in terms of protecting the independence of uh, journalists. Uh, and then something that is well documented again from a qualitative point of view, uh, the fact that it played a pretty important role uh, in the success of uh, Eric Zemmour. So you know the guy who was not classified as a politician uh, during the last uh, presidential election in, uh, in France. Okay, so what do we do uh, uh, with our data to properly quantify the effect of the takeover? We do like a simple difference in difference. So we are going to compare channel before, after the takeover. In our control group, we'll have all the channels uh, whose uh, ownership structure did not change. In the treated group, we'll have all the channels acquired by Vincent Bolloré. For the sake of uh, uh, clarity and transparency to understand what happens, we do that both in the short term, 2015-17, and mid term, 2017-19. Okay? Uh, and we control, so we have two different estimation strategies. In the first one, we control for channel fixed effect, time fixed effect and the number of like uh, different uh, characteristics. In the second specification, we go a little bit further. Rather than having the channel fixed effect, we have channel host fixed effect. So there we identify on host who stay. So then we don't just only look, in fact, at the change in the editorial line. We look at the change in invitation pattern of the host who stay to see whether or not uh, they do comply with the new editorial line. Just to be completely reassuring, these channels, they, they were not on the right uh, before, and there were no trends towards more radical right uh, guests uh, before the takeover. The takeover took place in 2015. So in this gray line, you see like no difference with other channels before, and then a jump in the speaking time of the radical right uh, following the, the takeover. To be totally honest, if anything, if you look at our, our data, uh, Italy was more on the left hand side of the political spectrum uh, before the takeover, and then it shift uh, towards the radical right. Uh, in terms of uh, the, 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 the magnitude of the, of the effect, uh, here, if you look at the speaking time of the radical right, you had in the short term an increase by 1.68%, uh, in the medium run an increase by 4.46% uh, of the speaking time of the radical right compared to a baseline that was uh, 8.6 percentage point. So basically you have an increase by 50% of the speaking time of the radical right overall. And this come mainly at the expense of the right. Also a little bit of the radical left, uh, green and left, but the effect is not statistically significant. So this is overall with the channel fixed effect. Now, if you look at compliance, focus on the host who stayed on the channel, you see the same increase in the speaking time of the radical right. And then you really see that it comes mostly at the expense of the radical left, who got like less invitation. Uh, and the, 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 for, for the right, the, the change is no longer statistically uh, significant. OK? This was expecting in a sense. What is really new, and to the extent of our knowledge has never been done in the literature, is to look at the kind of guest uh, host who stayed and the kind of host who lived, and also to try to understand where did they go uh, following the, uh, the, the, the takeover. So the first thing that we did is something pretty simple. In fact, uh, we did the same thing as before, but on the left-hand side, uh, we look at an indicator variable of whether a journalist who was there uh, during the previous quarter is still working on the channel uh, during the following uh, quarter. So the probability of like, uh, like uh, turnover uh, following the takeover versus the probability of turnover on the other channels. What do you find uh, here? You find the following. Basically, again, this is pretty flat before the takeover. 
So the probability for mo moving from one channel to the other was not higher on the channels uh, acquired by Bolloré before the, the takeover. Okay, they were just behaving as the other channel. But then you see that the probability of no longer working on the channel like dropped by 20 percentage points compared to the other channel uh, following the takeover. Here, if, if we just like take like all the, all the hosts, if we weight the host by their screening time, uh, by their screen time share, we see that the effect is even more uh, important. Okay, and so you have this drop by nearly like 40% in the probability of uh, leaving, uh, uh, leaving the, 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 the channel. Uh, just to give you uh, uh, again an, uh, an order of uh, magnitude, so you have this drop in the medium run by 13% of the probability of leaving the channel. The, the baseline is uh, 38.3. So you have an increase uh, by one third on average of the probability of leaving, uh, leaving the channel due to uh, Bolloré takeover. Then what is nice in what we can do that we can look at this probability of leaving the channel. But we can also look at the probability of, uh, of the, at the characteristics of the guests who leave, like whether those are guests with more political uh, hosts with more political guests, uh, whether those are journalists, whether they were in charge of the newscast, whether you have an higher probability for the male or female journalist, whether they are famous as measured by their uh, uh, um, um, who is who uh, uh, entry. Uh, uh, look at their ratings also, this kind of stuff. How do you, okay, if I want to summarize this uh, table in one minute, basically we see that the, the, the guests that are more likely to leave are those that are politically classified guests, those that are journalists, and those who show is a newscast. I really want to highlight that. It means that this is not only about a boss taking control of a firm and firing people randomly. This might happen in a, lot of, in a lot of firms, okay? And you might tell me, okay, the good baseline is not to compare Bolloré channel to other channel because on other channel, you have no change in ownership. And when you have a new owner, okay, uh, in any firms, except for the university, but we are not owned by anyone, so that's better, uh, uh, you can fire people and have a lot of like uh, turnover. But what is striking here is that this is not random at all. Because those who live with the highest probability are those that were like more engaged with political programs, have a newscast, have a, are a journalist, uh, or do invite political guests. So it does not fire basically. Uh, if I want to caricature a little bit, the, the one that was in charge of like uh, showing uh, meteo, okay, but he fired the guy that was in charge of like a newscast, and this appears very clearly uh, in the data uh, in the data here. So then the question is, where do they go? And what you see here, uh, which is a little bit depressing, is that uh, many hosts uh, simply, simply quit journalism. So to be more specific, they quit or sample. But our sample include all the main TV and radio channels. So they could have go and work for a newspaper, for example. Uh, but if I were to show you data on the evolution of the number of jobs in the journalist, uh, uh, of journalists in the newspaper industry, you will understand that this is not what happened to the majority of them. And then we also have a lot of qualitative evidence. Uh, so we have uh, nearly an increase of like 30% of, uh, those, uh, of uh, those journalists who just quit journalism, uh, which is bad per se, I have to say, because it means that overall, we have like less people working as journalists. The other thing that we can do, uh, and I am going to uh, uh, finish with that, we, we have those uh, uh, that stay in journalism. We can look at the characteristics of the channel they join. And in particular, we can look at the political bias of the channel they join. If you do that, for example, uh, looking at right-wing channel, uh, here you have uh, uh, those that are in the Q1, in the bottom quartile, of the channels in terms of right wing invitation, see that a lot of them move to this channel with a low ratio of right wing guests. If you look at Q2 or the third quartile, then you have no effect. So basically, what you show is that those who left but who are still journalists, they tend to go mainly on channels with lower speaking time for the right. 
So basically, those who don't want to comply, they don't want to comply because they were not good in terms of sorting. And so they join journalists that uh, they join media outlets that correspond better uh, to their own uh, to their own preferences. Okay. Just one word in terms of uh, uh, policy uh, implication. Uh, okay. So we have a lot of work, empirical evidence. I mentioned some papers on Fox News, Sinclair, uh, that show that when you have a change in uh, ownership, you can have a change in uh, media content. Uh, and that uh, this might also uh, impact voters' behavior. Okay, What we do and what is new here is really to understand the mechanism through which uh, it, uh, it happened. What we cannot really do, as is done, for example, in the De La Vigna paper, uh, De La Vigna Kaplan paper, we cannot really look directly at the effect on voters. So, for example, um, we have suggestive evidence. I can document, we can talk about that. We try to convince the readers in the paper uh, that the shift towards the radical right of Bolloré Channel, it helps a lot Eric Zemmour. But it's hard to put that into the data because we do not have uh, heterogeneity in the penetration of CNews. It's kind of an homogeneous shock over the French territory, so we don't have enough variation. Still, thanks to Richard, we have the Reuters data that allow us to have like some qualitative evidence. So what uh, Reuters Institute uh, does in the, in the survey data is basically you have information on the uh, news outlets consumed uh, by the citizens, and they also ask people to rank them, themselves on a uh, zero to 10 uh, left-wing uh, scale. So basically, when you are at zero, you are more on the left. Uh, when you are at 10, you are more on the right. And here, I take the average, depending on the kind of media outlets you claim you consume. Okay, This is just suggestive, but I think it's of interest. If you look at CNews Italy before the takeover, so I have data for 2013, uh, we see that they rank on the left compared to the average population uh, that is surveyed in the data. Okay, These are below the average, which is this dashed uh, black line. If you look at 2018, you see now they are a little bit above. If you look at 2019, they're even more above. And if you look at uh, 2020, the effect is even stronger. So of course, I'm not claiming that this move to the right is due to the same viewers watching Fox News, uh, watching, Fox News watching C News, who change their mind. Because this is not panel data. Okay? This is a repeated cross-section. So this might also be due to the fact that you have new viewers watching the news. But still, this is interesting evidence of the fact that you have also a shift in the characteristics of the viewers in terms of their uh, political preferences. The last thing I want to highlight, because this is important, and this is also linked to, to that, you might say just that, OK, Bolloré is a clever guy. France is turning more towards the radical right. The guy wanted to make more money. So he shifted uh, the uh, editorial line of the channel to the right because he thought it was a way to acquire more audience. What we do document here, and I put that overall, you see more of an effect. In fact, if you look like channel by channel, in particular for Canal+, Plus, what we see that following uh, the takeover compared to the audience of other channels, uh, you have a drop in audience. So the shift to the right came at an audience cost. So this is not something that is driven by, by demand or something that was likely to a huge political uh, uh, positive shock in terms of audience. People were so happy to see so many radical right guys that they all shift to Blu-ray channel. We see kind of the reverse in the data. Again, there are limits in what we do. I cannot claim that it means that it was not profitable, in particular because you have the issue of revenues and the issue of cost. For revenues, we know that revenues collapse because like drop in audience was associated with a drop in advertising revenues. We have that in the paper. I don't have time to present that to you here. He also decided to do less news, more talk shows, so basically less journalists that I, that I show you. So he reduced on cost. So at the end of the day, in terms of overall profitability, uh, perhaps it was a little bit more uh, complicated. So uh, but in fact, I am, uh, I am done. Uh, so we are in this context of like growing concentration and polarization of the media uh, with a lot of change in ownership, 
Here, we want to understand the determinants of media bias. We saw the importance of the role played by channel fixed effect. Uh, with the case of Bolloré, we also see that a lot of these channel fixed effects are driven by the preferences uh, of the uh, of the owners uh, that uh, host, they need to comply with the editorial line. They do not have a lot of agency, even if some of them have, depending on their characteristics. Uh, uh, and we do that thanks to this uh, uh, novel data that we collect and put together, as well as to the use of this uh, time varying game model. And now I see my co-author that wants me to end. So I'm ending here. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you.